The United States says it will train Ukrainian pilots to fly F-16 fighters after European countries pledged to give Kyiv the jets. The Pentagon said that flight training would begin in the US state of Arizona in October. Denmark, the Netherlands and Norway have all announced that they will provide Ukraine with the advanced US-made aircraft. Kyiv has long been seeking the jets to bolster its Soviet-era air force, but training will likely take several months. Tim Ripley is a journalist specialising in defence and military affairs. He joins us now from London. Thanks for joining us here on DW. So, training will take several months. Could you take an informed guess as to how many months exactly uh, before Ukrainian forces will be flying F-16s in combat? Well, that, that's, that's, that is too many imponder imponderables in there because it's, it's not just a case of training pilots. You have to train all the maintainers. You have to uh, set up lots of enabling forces to try and uh, support the aircraft. So, it, I mean, just to actually fly the planes is really the easy bit. It's turning other planes into a uh, part of a military aviation combat system that is a difficult thing for the Ukrainians. I mean, uh, if you look at how the, the, the British, Americans or Germans or NATO operated in the 1991 Gulf War over Afghanistan, or Libya, the Western way of using these aircraft is, is part of a system. You have eight wax radar planes to find the enemy fighters. You have jamming planes to defeat the, the uh, enemy surface-to-air missiles. You have refueling tanks, all that kind of stuff that gets the plane to the fight. And the Ukrainians don't have any of that at the moment. They just, they are an insurgent air force. They are uh, in a fighting hit and run attacks. And how you insert a Western fighter into that kind of scenario is very difficult to imagine. So would that mean that they require in Ukraine engineers, say from the donor countries to actually be on site in Ukraine? P possibly, or they, or they need to start training them up as well. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's not, it's, you have to think of this as, as, as not just one plane against the Russian air force. This is, this, this, this involves a complete overhaul of the Ukrainian air force and air defences to fight with these aircraft. So th this is this is a, a major project beyond just training a few pilots. Right. So it's essentially almost like an infrastructural project uh, that's that's underway. Oh, um, yes, yes. And, and, and also tactics and and support in, uh, weapons and support forces as well. All right, well, let's talk a little bit about what difference um, it would make uh, to Ukraine if they had this FT F-16 fleet um, in their ability to um, resist Russian aggression. Well, the key thing, and we're not really sure about this, is the kind of weapons they get on the plane. Now, uh, in terms of air-to-air -air combat, they need to really make a difference, a thing called the AMRAM, AM-120, which is a beyond visual range missile which can hit targets between 30, 40 miles, uh, 50 kilometers away from the aircraft. Uh, and that's what they really need to um, take on the Russian MiGs and Sukhois. Uh, now, in terms of ground attack, again, you need standoff weapons, uh, much like we've, we've seen with the British Storm Shadow, the French Scalp. Uh, so are the U Ukrainians going to get standoff weapons to attack uh, uh, Russian ground targets. These are things we don't really know. And unless they get these kinds of weapons, uh, the F-16 in itself is not a game changer. Russia says it's thwarted a massive Ukrainian drone attack on the occupied Crimean Peninsula a day after Kyiv claimed it had carried out a special forces raid on the territory. Moscow's Defence Ministry said 42 drones were either shot down or jammed electronically. Kyiv has ramped up attacks on Crimea in recent weeks. Ukrainian officials say they are determined to take back the peninsula. Well, meanwhile, back in Russia, President Vladimir Putin has sent his condolences to the family of Yevgeny Prigozhin, saying he made mistakes but achieved results. Russian authorities say the Wagner mercenary leader was listed as a passenger on a flight that crashed with no survivors. Prigozhin had been one of Putin's most important allies until June, when he led an armed rebellion against Moscow's military leadership. Wagner headquarters in St. Petersburg. Here, Yevgeny Prigozhin's supporters have been laying down flowers and tributes for the mercenary leader. 
Among them is Dmitri, carrying a bundle of cloves and a sledgehammer. It's become a symbol for Wagner after a video emerged last year purportedly showing a sledgehammer used to execute a deserter. To fear nothing is engraved on this one. Dmitri worships Prigozhin like many here. Because he fought for freedom, because he defended Russia's interests. One way or another, he was a hero for our country. He did many heroic things and he gave us hope. Not many can do that. It's still not fully clear if Yevgeny Prigozhin was aboard the plane that crashed north of Moscow. Some have speculated it was downed by a bomb or a missile, but few believe it was an accident. A Wagner-affiliated telegram channel was quick to announce that Prigozhin's name was on the flight list. Russian President Vladimir Putin was also unusually quick to respond. He said there was evidence that Prigozhin was on board, thereafter only referring to him in the past tense. I knew Prigozhin for a long time, since the beginning of the 90s. He was a person with a complicated history. He made grave errors in life, but he also achieved the right results for himself and for our common goals when I asked him to do things. Yevgeny Prigozhin became a powerful figure as the head of Wagner, a mercenary group notorious for its brutality in Ukraine and around the world. But Prigozhin became a threat to Putin's power after leading a short-lived mutiny and a march on Moscow. Two other senior Wagner figures were also listed on the flight, pointing to a decapitation of the group's leadership. Putin is still likely to need Wagner fighters, but placing the mercenaries under regular Russian command could be a challenge. Well, Russia's presence in on the African continent heavily depends on the Wagner group. But now, after the possible death of the head of the group, Evgeny Prigozhin, there is uncertainty about the private military's role. Many African countries depend on Russia for economic aid. Russia exerts its influence also through military cooperation. This often involves the Wagner Group. The mercenary group has been active in countries like Mali, Sudan, Libya and Central African Republic. Wagner is also accused of political interference in these countries. DW reporter Tommy Oladipo is with me in the studio. Good to see you, Tommy. Wagner are inf infamous in parts of Africa. How has the news of Prigozhin's death and perhaps the rest of the leadership, how has that been, been received on the continent? I think the continent is, is watching, like the rest of the world, with, with raised eyebrows and, and watching the saga unfold and wondering how it happened and if he is truly dead. Um, what we haven't heard is any statement or official statements from uh, these countries you mentioned that um, Wagner has uh, been present. We know that, you know, the Central African Republic helping train uh, the, the military there, the armed forces there in Mali in an anti-jihadist uh, campaign, as well as in Libya and in Sudan, um, you know, working with the security there as well. But we've not heard anything from these states in particular. So Wagner had withdrawn from Ukraine, but was and is still active in West Africa, as you say. Uh, what's likely to happen to this very lucrative business there in Africa? We, we need to look at the different countries individually. First of all, the Central African Republic. The situation there is that the country has been in war and needs support um, against the rebels there. The country contracted Russia to help. And so it's likely that they will go back to Russia and, you know, Russia will sort the deal out. I don't think that, um, you know, Prigozhin's absence or the rest of the, the leadership will have a significant impact on uh, what happens there because Russia has this duty to this country it's working with. Right. In Mali, which is a different case, it appears as if they have been working directly with Wagner. Uh, but what we could see, because Mali has evicted uh, the, the, the UN peacekeeping force that was there, it also evicted France, which was helping in the, in the anti-jihadist uh, operation there. It looks... I, my, my 
speculation is they will, they are, because Mali is isolated, they will look to Russia again and say, Russia as the state, can you help us in this fight? Because they don't have many allies at the moment that will help them against this big threat from groups linked to Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State. Yeah, as you say, it changes from country to country. We've seen Wagner working with military hunters in the Sahel region right across it. Are those military rulers now wondering who's going to keep them in power? Definitely, I think they, they would they would um, you know have to consider that in Mali, for example, with the with the um, the hunter there, they are struggling. That's why they reached out to the to the Russians, and if they're not able to get any help, and of course, as I mentioned, they don't have the French and, and the other nations that were there, they will really struggle under the weight of this jihadi um, situation, as well as what has emerged now since the coup. Uh, there is separatist groups in the north of Mali, which had sort of been uh, subdued and, and sort of t um, gone quiet, and now reviving their, their agitation and are coming out again. So it looks like they'll have lots of problems from multiple fronts to deal with. Russia's presence in the African continent heavily depends on the Wagner Group, but now, after the presumed death of the head of the Wagner Group, Yevgeny Prigozhin, there is uncertainty about the private military's role. Many African countries depend on Russia for economic aid. Russia exerts its influence also through military cooperation. This often involves the Wagner Group. The mercenary group has been active in countries like Mali, Sudan, Libya and the Central African Republic. Wagner is also accused of political interference in these countries. Well, our correspondent, Olisa Chukwuma, has more on this for us. He joins me from Lagos in Nigeria. Olisa, now the Wagner Group is a key tool for Moscow to uh, project uh, power in Africa, but multiple African governments also depend on the group to control rebel movements. How is the news of Prigozhin's presumed death being received on the continent? Well, Pablo, uh, you might say it's been a bit uh, mixed since the news broke about uh, the uh, leader of the Wagner Group, uh, uh, Evgeny Prigozhin, presumed dead. Now, as you said, uh, a lot of Afri some African countries uh, depend on you know Russian aid, and also in terms of military cooperation that we've seen in places like Libya and West Africa, particularly Mali, and quite close here in Central African Republic. Uh, now, it doesn't ostensibly mean that there might be an end to Wagner operations on the continent. I think that's what pre uh, many experts are pointing to because uh, from the recent, even last video we uh, purportedly saw of, uh, of Prigozhin, he mentioned to be in some location in Africa, uh, and Russia uh, authorities have spoken about the success about Wagner operations, both militaristically and also in terms of economic cooperations uh, being driven as a, more like a geostrategic positioning for Russia. So, uh, yes, it might be presumed then uh, uh, dead, but it doesn't mean that there's an end to Wagner operations for Russia on the continent. Now, the ruling junta in Mali, for example, have isolated themselves from the West and are facing armed insurrection. Would they be able to stay in power without the backing from Russia? Well, Pablo, that's the uh, tricky part for a country like Mali. We're clearly open arms uh, re in terms of receiving Russian support, uh, you know, and both economic ties and also in terms of military training for locals. Uh, Mali, as we know, is under a military junta. They've also got, you know, a case of a transition on timeline with ECOWAS, which is still uh, another debate for another day, if you are, you know, many might say. Uh, but they are trying to hold on to power in terms of fighting of the jihadi uh, insurgency, which Russia has been a huge uh, part in support since they, you know, annexed uh, uh, France and cut all military security ties with France. So it, lets to be, it remains to be seen how the, you know, the military junta in Mali will be able to fight off the, the jihadi, uh, continue the jihadi fight without, you know, Russian support or uh, Wagner support. But clearly, uh, it's one something that, you know, the Malians will have to look uh, twice at with uh, this news about uh, Dmitry uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin's uh, dem supposed demise. Now, with Prigozhin's uh, presumed uh, death, um, who can they turn to now? Well, many will say that uh, Wagner will still have operations uh, in Africa and they can turn to maybe not so charismatic personalities within the uh, Wagner hierarchy, uh, especially after the kind of a profile of people involved with Wagner reported in that plane crash. Uh, one thing's for sure, uh, the uh, Russian influence has to continue from a, a Kremlin perspective. Uh, so uh, it doesn't automatically mean a, disband, a disbandment. So they will have to just focus on the kind of uh, contractual uh, economic uh, agreements they have with Russia 
uh, on the ground, especially places like the Central African Republic uh, and also places like Mali. They will have to rely on them because uh, these are contracts signed. They've got mineral rich, uh, you know, uh, economic uh, ties with it. So they still have to hold on to it. Thanks, uh, Olisa. Olisa Chukwuma talking to us from Lagos in Nigeria.